Hi everyone, we are here at the AI4 conference in Nukuwai with me, Kevin. Welcome to the Ravid Show again. Not a new face to the show. Yes, thanks for having me again. It's exciting. Now we're seeing each other all over the place now. This is great. Exactly. And I think uh, in the last eight months, the growth that I've seen for Mabel is extraordinary. And that is one of the reasons I was like, I'm not missing chatting with Kevin this time and learning more about what's happening, what has changed in the last eight months uh, at Mabel. But also before we get into that, I would love for you to just do a quick intro, tell us more about what Mabel does. Yeah, sure. So Mabel is uh, the runtime platform for generative AI. We allow product and engineering teams to build competent AI solutions. Uh, and what I mean by that is we measure uncertainty in the process from data ingestion to retrieval, uh, which allows you to actually score how well your AI is doing right. and make your AI better over time, right? Uh, and we have been growing a lot since the last time I think we saw each other was in New York. New York, uh, right. In New York, uh, we didn't have our funding round yet, so we just closed that a few months ago. Uh, so that's been great for us, uh, not yeah. only the growth of customers and the growth of the platform, uh, but pulling in that initial seed round of funding uh, has been great for us, and uh, we've been expanding, hiring, growing the business, uh, and we've had a lot of fun doing it. You all are doing it the right way, and I've been seeing all the growth, uh, not only just with uh you know, the number of people who are joining the team, but also the number of customers. Mm -hmm. So that's fantastic. Uh, quick question, yeah, again, in last eight months, uh, what do you see in the AI space that has also changed? Because I, I remember we spoke about a lot about explainable AI back then. Yep. Uh, how do you feel like in, last eight, in eight months, AI kind of also changed? Yeah, so I think explainable is, it, it's still a thing, right? right. And people are still wondering about it, but what does explainability actually mean, right? Um, and do you actually need to explain how the model thought process is running? Like, if I ask you a question, you, and I said, well, how do you come to that answer? Do you actually tell me, like, oh, well, the neuron, this neuron in my brain fired to this <laughs> neuron in my brain, and the, and the combination of all these neurons, like, put together the answer? We don't do that, right? Yeah, right. You judge the output based on the data that you look at, right. how you applied your knowledge to it, and then the fidelity of the output. And I think we need to look at AI in the same way. And that's what we think about at Maybell, is a lot of our customers want to take their proprietary information, their proprietary data, and they want to make sure, one, that proprietary data is not making it back out into a training model somewhere or something like that, but also that their data is being used in the responses, right? right? Like, what is the fidelity of their data showing up in the outcomes of the AI that they're creating? and how do you track that back to their data? You don't necessarily have to go back to the underlying LLM to understand you know, the regression analysis of how the LLM put that together, but trace those sparse, uh, sparse vectors, tokens, dense vectors, track them back to how the ingestion process happened to the output, right. and now you can get a high fidelity uh, understanding of what the output is. So, uh, for us, that's what explainability means. We have about 14 different uh, pillars that we test AI responses on. Nice. Everything from context grounding to LLM judges uh, to basic NLP judges on how well the context you delivered to the LLM is actually showing up in the output. Okay, that's fantastic and uh, great insights there. Uh, Kevin, we also know for a fact where, and I've seen this, these statistics a lot, uh, which is where maybe 80% almost close to 80% of the AI projects actually <laughs> fail. Is it true? You know, I think it depends on what you're looking at. I, I, I think that number is true, um, okay. but I think a lot of people are experimenting with AI. Okay, yeah. So I think it's both a good number and a concerning number. Okay. I think it's a good number because it means a lot of people are saying, AI, I feel AI is the technology that I need to solve a certain problem. So they're going out and doing the thing. Right. Now it's not usually as easy as just taking AI and applying it to a problem, yeah. and, and that's the issue, right? And when it comes to what you want to accomplish with AI, how do you get it over the hump into a production environment? Uh, at Maybell, we are helping customers solve that problem, but I think that's what people are running into. And I think mm -hmm. the good part about that number is that people are identifying AI as I really think this is the thing that's gonna solve my problem, what we need to help them with is getting to the next step so they can run at scale and run in production. And what are some of the common, you know, obviously, uh, problems that you see that the customers run into when they're implementing AI? It could be data quality, data governance, it could be 
AI governance as well. well from your lens and from the customers that you work with, uh, what are you hearing? And I know you talk to a lot of other enterprise leaders as well and get a lot of feedback around AI and how they are building the AI stack too. So, yeah. I think one of the biggest things is we really believe at Maybell you can't deploy what you can't measure. And I think one of the big problems is, is you implement AI, the answers feel good, they might look good, they might feel good if you need to put a human next to them for every output, but if you don't have a human next for them, next to them for every output, if you want to automate that process and you want to look at the statistics of how you're doing with AI overall, not have to look at every single output, how do you score that? How do you measure that? How do you know if you're doing well or or not? not right. And I think that's that's been a problem, and I think that goes back to what we see as Maybell is if you're not doing the correct context engineering to begin with, if you're not looking how to optimize the context windows and the vectors going into the process Very to begin important. with, then you're not going to understand the fidelity of the output and you're not going to be able to measure that uh, and see how well you're doing at the end. So I think measurement is a big thing. And I think context engineering. Context engineering is more complicated than simply taking a, a, a large prompt or a large contact win context window, filling it up and shoving it to the LLM very, very well uh, put together context engineering with the correct type of rag, tag, and other solutions that you need to do, looking about how data is structured, unstructured, how it's pieced together, and how it should be presented to an LLM right. is a science. Uh, and I think people look towards the end instead of looking towards the beginning, and if you don't start well, you're not going to end well. Wow, those are really yeah. great insights and great points that you mentioned, but I, I want to, you know, dive a little bit deeper into context engineering as well. We've been, you know, obviously uh, hearing more lately about the context that you, like you said, it's not only just the game of, you know, just feeding it to your LLM and, you know, getting results out of it. How can context engineering really be used by enterprise leaders in the AI implementation process? Is there a particular framework? Is there something uh, that they should be following to make sure that they kind of get results, they kind of get the right data, maybe structured, unstructured data, according to what they've been kind of, you know, uh, put across all departments. And it just eases up things for everyone where, oh, there's now a prompt that you can throw at and you can get amazing results because the context engineering is playing in the background very well. Yeah, I think how we look at it, Maybell kind of takes the context engineering problem off your hands, right? Okay. But to dive into that, like if you were to go in and DIY it yourself, like we're standing in front yep. of it, like you kind of have to take, you have to take all of this into account from a context engineering perspective. Right. How are you building confidence from the data ingestion process? When you look at your data, how are you deciding how that data relates to each other and how you're going to solve for the top K analysis that you want out of the retrieval process? You need to decide right. that very early on. Uh, like, what am I going to do for my retrieval process? Like, what's the contextual nature that I'm going to look at the data and how am I going to receive it? So there's a lot of different mechanisms you use. You can stand up your own vector databases, stand up your own graph databases. You can do your own LLM judges. Like you can put all of these things together, then you got to manage it, then you got to have people who understand right. it, then you got to get the metrics from it, or you know, you can use a platform from a Maybell perspective and you can get that, you know, handed to you. And from an enterprise perspective, and especially from the customers we're talking about, the AI ops infrastructure is not a differentiating point in their business, right? Yep. They're not going to market saying like, our AI ops infrastructure is so much better than the other businesses' AI ops infrastructure. They have a product they're delivering. Their engineering teams need to focus on a product and we want to allow them to focus on building that product and not having to focus on you know, very complex uh, context engineering or even AI ops. We right. want them to be able to use APIs and SDKs, use feedback loops to make their AI better, but not have to necessarily worry about all the things you see here. I'm glad you mentioned this, this, all these points to me, Kevin, because for me, context engineering was only till chat, chat GPT is what I was kind of wondering <laughs> that, okay, here are the prompts I'm going to give, and now the model is going to learn from itself and going to throw answers at me, but it does play way differently when it, you know, you, the enterprise leaders have to do data into it. You want to optimize for that context window. If you're not optimizing for that context window, especially if you're going to run AI at scale, yep. you're going to run into a very, very expensive very expensive, True. not not you know not high fidelity answer, and you're not going to know how to measure the output, 
and you're going to spend a lot of money on GPUs and CPUs just throwing too much information to get the answer that you want. That's true, yeah, exactly. The cost, the scalability as well, everything kind of hampers if you're not hitting the context there. So right. that's very true, Kevin. Uh, a little bit, uh, kind of wanting to shift gears a little bit into the future as well. How do you see, I'm not going to say two years to three years, but maybe next six to seven months. It changes every week now, so, you know. Yeah, yeah. you're right, because I know we spoke about so many things eight months back, a lot of things uh, which you predicted uh, kind of did come across, and I'm seeing those kind of things. Obviously, agents was one of the biggest things that you mentioned about it uh, last time. So I'm kind of curious to hear from you a little bit about the future as well. How are you kind of seeing the space evolve in the next maybe six months? Uh, yeah. I see two major pillars forming in AI right now. I see a pillar where AI sits next to a human and makes a human better in right. a business. So ChatGPT is a great example of that, right? You can sit down with ChatGPT and you can iterate as a person with that and make yourself better. Developer co-pilots are part of this group, where a developer sits next to an AI that they continuously use to make their themselves better as a person. Then there's another pillar of AI where people are creating new products, new revenue streams, new business models on top of AI. Right. We kind of sit in that latter half and, and, okay. and, and not the first one, but I do see uh, two scenarios, I mean, there's probably more things, but these two sure. big buckets, okay. I believe is where you're going to see a lot of AI people or a lot of AI companies uh, focusing on whether I'm going to make a human better, specifically at the thing that they're doing, right. or I'm making an at scale process better with AI. And there are two different problems that you need to solve. That's a very good point there. And uh, one last question for you, Kevin, is around uh, the future of Mabel as well. Yeah. How are you seeing that? Uh, I know you, you all innovate uh, faster than I can even think. You all are a very lean team, but you all do it very well. Mm -hmm. uh, I met the CTO, Kiran, as well. Uh, amazing We got to get him on the show. We, we need to we do need that. We need to, yeah. Yeah, yeah for yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> the next time when we when you see Kevin and me, there'll be Kiran as well, I yes, promise. we got to uh, bring Kiran on here. We'll, we'll get more uh, insights from Kiran as well. But uh, Kevin, back to, you know, what do you, what do you think about Mabel and the future? Uh, we are going to continue to grow. We're going to keep emphasizing that if you don't prepare and, 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 and have the proper context engineering of your data to present to AI, you're not going to get the outputs. Right. Uh, we're doubling down on this adaptive ingest process. Nice. Uh, we have a lot coming out. We had a talk uh, this conference about yeah. structurable data and how you find structure and unstructured information. And a big move for Mabel going forward is how do you combine your structure and relational information with your unstructured information? Very and how good. do you take quantitative and qualitative information and be able to combine that together into single AI experience? experiences right. where you can rely on not only the numbers and the mathematics, but also things like topic analysis and, se and sentiment analysis and pull those together in an agentic way uh, that you can integrate into your workflows and integrate into your products and your platforms. Love it. I can't wait to see all the innovations that happen, but at the same time, I'll be watching closely again uh, all the things that you all have been doing. Uh, and I promise one last question, and that is about if people want to reach out to you, learn yes. more about uh, what you all have been doing. I know you put out a lot of content, a lot of, you know, uh, authentic content for the people which are not generated by AI <laughs> <laughs> in the real use cases. Um, where can they follow you, reach out to you, and also learn about Mabel? Yeah, so uh, website's the best place, uh, mabel.ai. Yep. Uh, you can reach us there. You can reach us on LinkedIn. Nice. Uh, you can find me pretty easily on LinkedIn. Nice. Uh, that's the best way to come uh, come and get us. Uh, okay. Email is kevin at mabel.ai. I'm a pretty easy guy to get a hold of, so if you yeah. search for Mabel, you can get to me pretty quickly. I agree. Kevin is the most approachable person, but most knowledgeable person in the AI space as well. So, Kevin, thanks for doing this. Thanks for Thanks. getting on the Robert Show. Always such a pleasure to chat with you. Uh, it was great. Thank Love you. to see you again. Can't wait. All the best. Uh, and thank you, everyone, for joining us today.